Good evening, I'm Susan Zash, Executive Director of the Human Rights Program. And on behalf of myself, Michael Geyer, our Faculty Director, the many members of our Faculty Board, a number of whom are here, our students and other faculty and staff, I'd like to welcome you all to the fourth annual Robert Kirshner Memorial Lecture. We're very pleased that Alexander Heyman accepted our invitation to be the fourth lecturer in a very distinguished series, which started with Sarah Paretsky, who's also here tonight, followed by Alex Kotlowitz, Juan Mendez, and I will introduce uh, Mr. Heyman in a minute. I wanted to thank the Kirshner family and friends for making this series possible with their establishment of the Robert H. Kirshner Memorial Fund. And it's particularly moving to me and to those of us who knew Bob that this year the lecture is occurring in the second week of the trial of police commander John Burge. And the Burge case, those of you who are from Chicago are familiar with it, um, Kirsch, um, Dr. Robert Kirshner worked in the early stages of the case. As a forensic pathologist, he testified in a trial in front of Judge Brian Duff in 1983, 84, which was the first case which cracked open the torture that had been going on in Area 2. We now know, uh, quite a number of years later, that close to 200 African American men were tortured using electric shocks, uh, suffocation techniques, um, all kinds of torture in the basement of a police station not very far from this building. And so before we get into the rest of the program, I just wanted to read a few paragraphs from John Conroy's book, Unspeakable Acts, Ordinary People, that talks about what Dr. Kirshner did as part of opening up what happened in these cases. And he's talking about um, the trial of um, a civil rights claim brought by Andrew Wilson, who was a cop killer, but who had been beaten very badly and tortured by uh, Burge and officers under his command. Wilson's attorneys, that's the people going after the torturers, pre presented an expert witness, Dr. Robert Kirshner, chief, deputy chief medical examiner of Cook County. Kirshner has an unusual countenance, a beard, no mustache, and dark, deep-set eyes and he was an unusual witness. As a forensic pathologist employed by the county, he spent a good portion of his time working with policemen and testifying for the state. His job day in and day out was to determine what weapons, devices, or accidents could have caused various injuries or deaths. And as a result, he was recognized as an expert in the identification of burns. Furthermore, in his spare time, Kirshner did human rights work, and he had taken part in investigations in Argentina, Kenyan, Ch Kenya, Czechoslovakia, and the West Bank under the auspices of Amnesty International, Physicians for Human Rights, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He served on the clinical committee of the Chicago-based Marjorie Kovler Center for the Treatment of Survivors of Torture and had taught other physicians how to diagnose and evaluate victims of torture. In a deposition taken five days before the trial started, Kirshner explained that he had become involved in the Wilson case when John Stainthorpe, one of the lawyers for Wilson, having heard that the doctor was an expert on torture, called him and asked Kirshner to look over Wilson's file. I said I would review it, Kirshner said, and I told Mr. Stainthorpe again that I was very skeptical because I have been around the medical examiner's office for 10 years, had a lot of close contact with the police, and I think I have a fair idea of what goes on in the police stations when people are in custody. And I said I had just never heard of anything like this in Chicago. And I said that it does not seem very unlikely to me that this would be the case, but Mr. Stainthorpe sent me the medical records and portions of Andrew Wilson's deposition, and I must say I read it, and I called Mr. Stainthorpe and said, this guy has been tortured. I think there is a very high degree of medical certainty to say this man has not only been beaten and kicked, which, let's face it, occurs in custody, but that this man has received electric shock. Kirshner's role in the Wilson trial was critical to opening up these cases. We're very, it's a shame that it has taken this long for anyone to be put on trial for the criminal acts that took place in the basement of Area 2, but we're very proud to be part of Bob Kirshner's legacy and to salute his work somewhat belatedly on these important cases. So now I want to do a couple of thank yous and a couple of acknowledgments and then we will get to the main part of the program. I want to thank Sarah Moberg for handling all the logistics for this event as she has for the last several years with her usual calm, 
competent manner. Everything seems to go smoothly, and that's the sort of work that's usually invisible when it, work, when it comes off very well. And this year, we're doing something new at this lecture. This is sort of our annual wrap-up. We like having the lecture around the time of alumni weekend. We've got some alumni. And we can congratulate students who we feel we want to honor because of their various achievements. First, I want to thank all the donors whose names appear in the program. We were faced with a $75,000 cut in our funding last July at the beginning of this fiscal year and decided to take the cut in our internship program instead of cutting staff. And all of you and the people whose, whose names are in the program responded beautifully. We raised $70,000 from new donors, which enable us to send out a full complement of 26 interns this month when you combine it with support from the university. And those 26 interns, and Bob would have been very proud of them, are working all over the world and in the city of Chicago, doing all kinds of amazing work in the name of human rights. I'd like tonight to recognize our graduates. This is the second year that students are graduating with human rights minors. Last year we had eight students graduate the college with human rights minors. This year we have 12. Their names are in the program. And I think for next year we're already up to 20. So if any of the students who are here who are graduating with human rights minors are here, we would love to have you stand up so you can be recognized by people. Come on, Ryan. Get up. Get up. And then we'd, we would also like to recognize those graduates who did human rights internships. Some of you are going to have to stand up twice. Those of you who did human rights internships while you were here, please stand up. Come on, Joanna. Lily. Those of you going out this year, Lauren, right? <laughs> Thank you very much. We, and then we have some awards. One is just an announcement. Um, Hannah Birnbaum is the fourth winner of the Dr. Isaac Wolf Human Rights Post Baccalaureate Fellowship. This is almost unique in the college. It gives the student a year's worth of salary and uh, medical insurance to work at an organization somewhere in the world. Our previous uh, Isaac Wolf winners were Rochelle Terman, who worked for an organization called Women Living Under Muslim Law. She was based in Montreal but traveled to the Middle East and all over the world. The second was Gary Lee, who worked at the Garment Workers' Rights Center in Los Angeles. Our, our Isaac Wolf uh, post back who's just finishing, Julia Coburn, has worked for the Centro de Derechos del Migrante Migrant Workers' Center in Zacatecas, Mexico. Hannah Birnbaum, is Hannah here? No, Hannah will be working at Business and Professional People for the Public Interest right here in Chicago, working on housing discrimination. So we're very pleased that we're going to have somebody local this year. Um, I would also like to recognize the um, three winners of this year's Ignacio Martín Barro Awards. This award, which we have usually done in a separate ceremony, we decided to bring fold into the Kirshner Lecture, in part because we feel we'll have a bigger audience and the students who win it will get more recognition, but also because Bob had a very particular role in this human rights case too. Ignacio Martín Barro was a Spanish Jesuit who came to the University of Chicago to get his doctoral degree in social psychology. When he finished his PhD, he went to El Salvador where he had been working previously and was one of the leading faculty at the Jesuit Central American University in El Salvador, responsible for raising a socially conscious generation of leaders who came to rebel, many of them, against the Salvadoran government. In 1989, Ignacio Martín Barro seven of the other Jesuits, their housekeeper and her daughter, were slaughtered by the Salvadoran army. They were just murdered in their beds. Bob Kirshner was at a human rights conference in Costa Rica when the murders occurred. And last year's speaker, Juan Mendez, a noted Latin American human rights lawyer and expert, told us that he had been at the conference in Costa Rica with Bob and that Bob left immediately to go to El Salvador to help the Jesuits examine the bodies. He had no fear. He knew where he had to be. El Salvador was in the worst stages of the most intense period of the Civil War, and Bob went where he was needed. So we're very proud to have an award named after Ignacio Martín Barro, who was a student at this university and in whose name a fund was set up in the Center for Latin American Studies. And it was decided to make this award, this memory of Ignacio Martín Barro, into an award for student work in human rights. Two of our three winners, their names are all in your program, are here today. Samantha Wishnack 
and Elizabeth Ostermuel, and I'd like you to come up and get your certificates, and there's a cash prize attached to this, which you'll get in the mail sometime soon. Elizabeth is a law student, and Samantha's an undergraduate. Thank you. Now I can introduce our speaker. The core principles of human rights are that human rights are universal and inalienable. The 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights was drafted and passed by the United Nations following waves of denationalizations, deportations, and displacements during and after World War II, including in the months just before its passage, the partitions of India, Pakistan, and Israel, Palestine. The UDHR was intended to embody the notion that there are fundamental rights possessed by all human beings that do not depend on the willingness of any individual nation state to defend or protect them. That the defense and protection of human rights and human dignity are the responsibility of all nations collectively and humanity in general. It is particularly appropriate that tonight's speaker for the fourth annual Robert Kirshner Lecture is Alexander Heyman, a writer who addresses the imperfect realization of this post-war vision, who understands the complexities of belonging to a community and feeling outside of prejudice and acceptance of the universality and particularity of the human condition. He's an author who, in the words of one critic, is hard to characterize. Another warns, slap a label on him at your own risk. I will therefore not attempt to characterize him or list his awards, which are in the program, but his writing speaks to many of us. We need writers of essays, of fiction, of history to help us transcend our individual worlds and understand the lives of others. Bob Kirshner, in his own work as a forensic pathologist, in his sense of humor, his passion as a teacher and advocate, his love of art and good food and drink, demonstrated a deep humanity which underlay his belief in the universality of human dignity and the need to strive to protect human rights. We are eager to hear the words of Alexander Hamon tonight as he addresses us on literature and individual sovereignty. So here I am talking about something that I hope pertains to the notion and idea of human rights, giving a lecture as though I knew something. Um, what I know is doubt, if this is why I'm a writer, I suppose, that I'm constantly mired in some sort of thought process that is never completed, and at some point I write it down that it's a book. But I have no conclusions um, to offer to you or definite truths. Um, I can tell you a story, though, and start from there. Back in the 80s, um, I was a student in Sarajevo, at the University of Sarajevo. I was an undergrad man majoring in general literature and minoring in librarianship. We read um, a lot, from Gilgamesh to 100 Years of Solitude. We spent our sophomore year, for instance, reading Dante exclusively. By the time I graduated, I was pretty well read in the history of mainly Western uh, literature. This was the time when my passion for literature was formulated. One of my favorite professors was a man named Nikola Kolevich. He was an expert on American New Criticism. His PhD thesis was on Tim Brooks, a famous new critic. He taught for a while at the U of University of Illinois down in Champaign. Um, he translated Rebecca West. He could quote Shakespeare off the top of his head. And he wore a tweed jacket with suede elbow patches <laughs> and a thick glasses, too. He was a kind of a stereotypical professor. The only writing course I had ever taken was his course in writing critical essays. This was an American thing because um, there are no, there's no uh, creative writing culture or industry or courses where I come from. He liked my writing, and he took my late, late adolescence ideas pretty seriously. He was very supportive. After I graduated in 1990, I called him, and we took a walk by the Milatska River in Sarajevo on a summer afternoon, discussing literature and life and such things. And I thanked him for everything that I learned from him. And then I wrote a, a very big story of about 48 pages, and I took it to him to show it to him, and he constructively tore it apart. 
It was painful, but I was grateful. His treating my literary efforts seriously made me feel that I was at the threshold of the lofty domain of serious literature, where he was at home. That domain, I felt, was a haven from the ugly politics of the day. It offered protection from the stupidity of warmongers and from the epidemic of nationalist madness sweeping through Bosnia and Yugoslavia in the very early 90s. The domain of literature, I thought, and art too, not just literature, was where philosophically, ethically, and morally sophisticated intellectuals gathered in solidarity. Those versed in Shakespeare or Dante would and could not stoop to participate in daily politics, let alone war. This is why I wanted to live, protected from history and politics, in ethical Eden. Needless to say, it didn't work. In 1991, Professor Kolevich joined the SDS, the Serbian Democratic Party, headed by Radovan Karadzic, who is spending his time in The Hague now, um, being tried for war crimes. I was working as a journalist at the time, a co co uh, covering cultural affairs. But I went once to an SDS press conference where Karadzic delivered genocidal threats veiled in nationalist platitudes of victimhood and historical injustice. My professor was sitting next to him. And after the press conference, I went to greet him. He was somewhat surprised to see me there. Stay out of this, he advised me. Stick to literature. So in 1992, war in Bosnia started, and the Serb forces started a campaign of genocide and ethnic cleansing, and they besieged Sarajevo. My professor was in the Serb leadership. I was ready to speak to foreign journalists in his fluent English. In fact, there is a film by Marcel Offlos, who made um, The Sorrow and the Pity, and um, Hotel Terminus is a documentary filmmaker. He's the son of the great Max Offlos. There's a, a film of his called The Troubles We've Seen, which has not been distributed here, but which is about um, the ethical engagement of journalists and focusing on journalists in Sarajevo during the siege, in which he follows um, a journalist to the mountains above Sarajevo to talk to the Serbs who are besieging it. This was uh, in, in the winter, at some, I think in 93 or 94, 93 probably. And he talks to my professor. They talk, that is, Mar um, Marcel Offlis and the journalist whose name I can't remember. And uh, this was the first time I saw him after I had left my, after this walk um, by the river. And in this, there's a scene or a moment when they're interviewing him and they're asking, why are you besieging and attacking Sarajevo? And he says, we are only defending ourselves because somehow the people from Sarajevo are running uphill through the snow to attack the Serbs. We didn't say that, but that's, that's what we knew. What I knew and what they knew. So as they're talking to him and asking him why you're attacking Sarajevo, he says, we're not doing that. You can hear the sound of artillery. Um, and they ask him, and what is this? It's one of those documentary moments that is priceless. And he says, with a slight smirk, um, this is the traditional way in which the Serbian people celebrate Christmas. Any case, um, he was in the Serb leadership and he, because of his fluent English, he delivered this in English. He spoke to foreign journalists. And it has been widely assumed that he was behind, implicitly or explicitly, the burning of the National Library of Sarajevo, in which hundreds of thousands of book, books were, um, were turned to ash. Um, and it was not the only library. There was a, a burning of the Library of the Oriental Institute in Sarajevo, where about 50,000 old manuscripts and documents in Arabic, Turkish, and Persian um, perished. So it's hard to escape the malignant irony of a literature professor burning down libraries. Professor Kolevich was fully complicit in all the crimes committed by the Serb nationalist and Radovan Karadzic and would have surely been indicted for war crimes had he not shot himself in 1997. For some reason, he had to shoot twice. I um, 
at the time when I heard that, I was hoping that his conscience compelled him to do that, to commit suicide. But the news claim, the news item claimed that he had left a note in which he said that what he did, he did for the Serbian people. Why am I telling you this little story? Because the ethically pure domain of literature was destroyed for me with the libraries of Sarajevo. When I found myself in Chicago in the early 90s, in a new country and a new language, I was forced to confront the question of the ethical value of literature. What does it do? What is it for? How does it help anyone? It offers no protection whatsoever from history. It obviously has no political agency. It makes no one better. It might make some people better, but my guess is that they would have become better without reading, perhaps. Maybe just singing. And if it does no ethical work, that it, um, then it is, at best, entertainment, which is in many ways the dominant mode of reading in this country. And I have to say that there are much better and more intense ways to entertain yourself than to read Dante, or to quote the immortal words of Sean Penn, um, who said, if you want entertainment, you get yourself two hookers and an eight ball. <laughs> the, eight ball the eight ball being, which is I had to, to ask about this because I'm not familiar with drug um, lingo. The eight ball is a particularly delightful drug concoction. They can keep you floating in, in a, an entirely different kind of lofty domain for a while. So I needed, I felt, to figure out the ethical value of literature. Not only so that I can continue writing, but more importantly to me, out of guilt. As I felt that while I was hallucinating the lofty domain of literature into flimsy existence, my professor and his genocidal cronies were orchestrating a vast crime. I felt complicit. Instead of paying attention, I looked the other way, upwards, as it were, toward near romantic heights. The crime happened under my watch because I was looking at the wrong thing. Because I don't know anything else other than books and reading and art and, well, a little bit of soccer, too. To understand what literature does, I had to turn to literature. So I read compulsively. <clears throat> rereading a lot of things that I had read while in college under the shadow and auspices of Professor Kordovich, trying to understand how it works, this thing called literature, which is most obviously entirely different from what is in this country called writing, insofar as it is a communal, indeed social, undertaking and can never be reduced to one voice or memoristic self-interpretation. Uh, to my mind, the relationship between writing and literature is very similar to the relationship between speech and language. We can, um, writing and speech are individual acts that are related to this and um, performed within this vast field of language or literature. Um, language and literature are fields in my mind rather than acts. Um, I read a lot, as I said, and I returned repeatedly to the work of Danilo Kish. I'm sure many of you know of him, but for those of you who might not, he, um, one of his most famous works is the um, A Tune for Boris Davidovich, which is about the uh, um, Soviet concentration camps. And it uh, created a, a bit of a scandal in Eastern Europe in the 70s. Um, and he was, it uh, made him into a, a famous writer. Um, Susan Zontai said that, uh, or claimed that he nearly received a Nobel Prize, but he died in 1989. And they don't give, he was in short visit, in other words, but they don't give the Nobel Prize to uh, dead people. Um, one of the one of his words that I kept returning to is a story from his book called The Encyclopedia of the Dead. The story, The Encyclopedia of the Dead. Um, I believe it's one of the greatest stories of the 20th century and perhaps of all time. 
it certainly is a great story to me. So let me remind you, or just outline the story. In the story, the narrator, an unnamed woman whose father has just died, spends the night, a night at the Royal Library in Stockholm, where she seems to have been given access to the famous Encyclopedia of the Dead, in which all the entries are devoted to individuals who are not mentioned in any other encyclopedia. The narrator reads the entry on her deceased father, which is fantastically comprehensive, recording, quote, every action, every thought, every creative breath. Nothing is omitted. Everything figures here only insofar as it pertains to the individual in question. Kish writes, quote, what makes the encyclopedia unique is the way it depicts human relationships, encounters, landscapes, the multitude of details that constitute a human life. For the encyclopedia, another quote, history is the sum of human destinies, the totality of ephemeral happenings, because there's nothing insignificant in a human life, no hierarchy of events. Let me read a little passage, just so you get a sense of what this uh, imaginary encyclopedia contains, its comprehensiveness. Um, now we are in Ruma, Kish writes, Ruma is the town where the father is um, working as a young man. Oh, actually, he's going to school. Now we are in Ruma, where my father received his secondary school education. Perhaps this example will give you an idea of how all-knowing, as they used to say, the Encyclopedia of the Dead actually is. The principle is clear, yet the erudition, the need to record it all, Everything a human life is made of is enough to take one's breath away. What we have here is a brief history of Ruma, a meteorological map, a description of the railway junction, the name of the printer and everything printed at the time, every newspaper, every book, the plays put on by itinerant companies and the attractions of tourist, uh, sorry, touring circuses, a description of a backyard where a young man leaning against a locust tree is whispering a mixture of romantic and rather ribald words into a girl's ear. We have the complete text. And everything, the train, the printing press, the finale of the bumptious bumpkin, the circus elephant, the track forking off in the direction of Shabbats, it all figures here only insofar as it pertains to the individual in question. There are also reports from, there are also excerpts from school reports, grades, drawings, names of classmates until the next to the last year when the young man had words with Professor L.D., the history and geography teacher. Nothing in the history of mankind is ever repeated, writes Kish. Things that at first glance seem to seem the same, things that at first glance seem the same are scarcely ever even similar. Each individual is a star unto himself. Everything happens, always and never. All things repeat themselves ad infinitum, yet are unique. That is why the encyclopedia stresses the particular. That is why every human being is sacred to them. The indelible irreplaceability of, indivi of the individual human experience is what makes every human being sacred, according to Kish. It becomes gradually clear in reading the story that the encyclopedia stands for the project of literature as conceived by Danilo Kish. We can call it humanist literature. Toward the end, he offers a clue. What is most amazing, he writes, is the encyclopedia's unique version of external and internal. It lays great stress on concrete facts, then creates a logical bond between the facts and man, or what we call man's soul. Kish always acknowledged his debt, his debt to Jorge Luis Borges. And the encyclopedia in its awesome totality is clearly a quasi Borgesian project. It is the Aleph in print, pardon the redundancy. But while for Borges the letter, the book, and the library constitute the lofty, infinitely comprehensive domain, transcending history, including, for example, the state terror conducted by the Argentine military, which Borges never really addressed, and um, it is indifferent to the individual lives perishing in the history. For Kish, the domain is entirely humanist and human. Toward the end, Kish's narrator says, 
I wanted some evidence for my hours of despair, that my father's life had not been in vain, that there were still people on earth who recorded and accorded value to every life, every affliction, every human experience. Meager consolation, but consolation nonetheless. For Kish, the encyclopedia and therefore literature, and by reverse extension language, is populated by irreplaceable, irreducible, sovereign individuals. The assumption of Kish's literature, of Kish's literary project, is the unimpeachable right of every individual to exist unconditionally. This is, in my mind, what uh, the very notion of human rights stems from. And in my mind, literature provides space within the totality of language for such unconditional existence. But such individual sovereignty can only be imagined. It cannot be achieved for reasons that seem to be self-evident. Because we're social beings, because there's always the impeachment of power um, or infringement of power upon the individual. Because the individuals are constituted, constituted in relation to their power. Um, Nevertheless, we can imagine the notion of uh, individual sovereignty because I believe of literature, which is why literature is a utopian project, as it were. The Encyclopedia of the Dead in Kish's story turns out to be a dream. It is a space of possibilities, a domain where every human life would be absolutely sovereign, where hierarchies of power would be dismantled and or reassembled according to the sanctity of the individual. In Kish's story, the encyclopedia came into being shortly after 1789, thereby being related to the utopian project of absolute equality that came out of the French Revolution. Indeed, the very concept of encyclopedia, a systematized knowledge of human domain, is a legacy of enlightenment. The simple fact is that we cannot know a whole human life. Even a single entry in the Encyclopedia of the Dead is a utopian project, not only because it is in fact impossible to compile all the details that constitute a human life, but even if it were possible, it would take a whole life to read a whole life. Um, in many ways, I think Joyce went as far or reached um, this utopian goal, um, or came as close to reaching this utopian goal as, as anyone else. I was not so long ago in Zurich, where there's a joy society. Um, and they have a kind of a book group. People get together in this institution and read Joyce's works. And I happened to be um, at a meeting of a, of a the book group reading Finnegan's Wake, um, where people sat around. There were some experts and graduate students and um, scholars but they were also, um, for the lack of a better word, amateurs. Or there are no amateur readers, really. And they sat around the table and parsed word for word Finnegan's Wake. And I asked them, how long does it take to read Finnegan's Wake? 11 years <laughs> is what took that. And the guy sitting next to me, who was a, a Swiss guy, with, I asked him, why are you doing this? He said, Apparently, there's nothing else to do in Switzerland. <laughs> so, so he, he, just, they, he just finished the first reading. Uh, he had been there for 11 years. So they just started the next reading. Uh, Ulysses takes only four or five years now. <laughs> Not a big deal. Um, but this comprehensiveness of human experience, um, you know, in the, in the Kish story, it, it is in the imaginary and imagined Encyclopedia of the Dead. But Joyce actually tried to do this, or got as close as he could. Um, in as much as in Ulysses, it's the 16 hours, or 14 hours or so of, the, of June 16, and where a speck of dust on Leopold Bloom's shoe is as um, relevant as any of the ideas that um, Stephen Dedalus is engaging with. Um, so he attempted to 
contain a, an entire human life in, in those moments, Joyce and Linz Klepila the dead. Um, and this speck of dust is a good example of, of I think, the way on uh, Leopold Bloom's shoe while he's sitting in the toilet. Um, is why literature is necessarily metonymical. Because we can only imagine a whole lot of fragments. That, that is, we can never uh, have a book like The Inscript of the Dead in reality, or even what Joyce tried to do, you know, when he tried to do it again, didn't quite work. Um, I mean, after Ulysses, Finnegan's Wake, doesn't quite work, famously. Um, so the speck of dust represents the un a universe of dust and all the specks of dust in Dublin on June 16, 1904. And it also represents um, or stands in for Leopold Bloom's um, sensory engagement with his environment. Out of this, we can imagine or try to imagine a whole life of Leopold Bloom. We are forced by this. Um, we are forced by the fact that we cannot know everything of human life to imagine human lives, someone else's and even ours, and we complete them with imagination. Liter literature is contingent upon imaginative engagement. It is a, it is fantastic testimony. It bears witness to imaginary lives. It thus provides model, a model for understanding other human beings. I believe that to imagine yourself as part of society or humanity, you have to imagine the existence of human beings who might perceive themselves as part of the same domain. You have to be able to imagine metonymically the rest of the lives of the people you encounter, engage with. And you have to, uh, uh, after the work of imagination, as it were, has been done, assume that they deserve the same rights that you feel you might deserve. In other words, um, humanity is an imaginary project in, in many ways. It's a utopian project. I, I believe that um, in literature, imaginative engagement inescapably assigns value to individual sovereignty. Literature allows engagement and connection between individuals based on the assumption of individual sovereignty. This is, I think, the ethical and political work of literature. This is why I also believe my professor burned down libraries. For his project was all about the collective sovereignty of the Serbian nation, which always overrode individual sovereignty or any other collective sovereignty for that matter. Now in Bosnia, I don't want to bore you with Bosnian politics. Um, the fact of the matter in the Bosnian constitution, this is a direct consequence of the war and the politics as um, of sovereignty and individuality and identity as conceived and performed by people like my ex-professor. In Bosnia, the political sovereignty lies with the sovereign nations, the three sovereign nations, the Serbs, the Scribes, and the Bosniaks. They are in the constitution as the constitutive nations of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is why individual rights are um, can only be performed within the nation. That is, you have the rights only if you're a member of a particular uh, national group. Um, there's uh, also in the Constitution and in various legal documents the notion of the others. That is, those who are not Bosniaks, Serbs, or Croats. Um, and those others are denied certain political rights. I, for example, wouldn't be able to be the Bosnian president. A great loss for the Bosnian. <laughs> um, and in fact, there was a, a lawsuit at a um, Human Rights Court in Strasbourg by um, Jakob Finzi, the Bosnian ambassador uh, in Switzerland, um, who is Jewish and a Romani man whose name I can't recall, because they claimed rightly and then won the suit that their uh, political rights were denied and that this went against the charter of, of, of yeah, human rights. Now, there's no way for this to be enforced in Bosnia, as the Bosnia is not going to change their constitution because of this lawsuit. Um, but individual sovereignty in Bosnia, in fact, is denied to a large number of people, regardless of ethnicity. In my professor's imagining, and I discovered this retroactive as it were, literature was all about collective sovereignty. 
it only um, it could only be national literature. It was exclusively invested in his mind. It was exclusively invested in expressing the essence of the nation, the soul of the people, which is always conveniently located in each ethnically defined individual, whose ethical and or historical agency could thus never begin to transcend the collective. The notion of individual sovereignty inherent in the humanist project of literature and human rights, for that matter, is why books are banned by repressive regimes or conservative library committees. As far as they're concerned, individual sovereignty is at best conditional. It depends on the individual meeting certain moral, political, or religious demands. At worst, the very possibility of individual sovereignty is contrary and inimical to the project of the absolute power of the state which deems it, it, which deems it its right to determine the conditions of individual existence. If such project is predicated upon the absolute sovereignty of a nation, as in the Nazi Germany, or working class, as in the USSR, individual sovereignty is inadmissible. This is why poets end up in concentration camps. Well, here's the paradox, I think. Um, the beauty of literature is that it is dependent on and often aware of the failure of its utopian project. Kish was surely aware that the Encyclopedia of the Dead was an, an impossible project, that it, it could not, in fact, um, exist because literature can never tell the whole story of humanity or even the whole story of a single individual. It can never totally represent human experience, which is to say that it, it can never fully transcend it. This failure is exactly what allows for the infinite variety of imaginative engagement, for the limitless possibilities of interpretation and reinterpretation. Much like human life, and not accidentally language, literature is uncompletable and irreducible. Literature produces humanity because it reproduces our failure to, to transcend humanity. Nothing, in other words, makes us more human than repeatedly trying and failing to be fully human. Thus, the right to fail is necessary for any literary project, as is the right to be wrong, as, as the right to be wrong is essential to the freedom of speech and the right to be imperfect morally, politically, religiously is the essential human right. Repressive regimes demand from literature to succeed at transcending the failure of individuality. As far as they're concerned, literature must show the way into a lofty utopian domain and provide models for collective perfection. Similarly, religion demands a way into transcendence. The refusal to provide those ways out is the mark of humanist literature. If we have nowhere to go, we have to turn to each other. The beauty of human life is that it's finite. There's no escape from mortality, which is the ultimate human imperfection. Death cannot be transcended. Perfect eternal life is not available. I'm sorry if this is news to anybody. Um, to paraphrase Nabokov, speaking of Chekhov, the greatest humanist writer and Chekhov's characters, mortality is the burden we can neither carry nor be rid of. Were the success of the utopian project of literature possible, we would either be able to carry the burden for everyone would be remembered as in the Encyclopedia of the Dead, or we would be rid of it by achieving transcendence. It would be possible to, to transcend death in language, and literature would be a fully spiritual, indeed, a religious project. But this life is it. And dealing with that fact requires courage, curiosity, imagination, language, and literature, all of which are severely impeded, damaged, or destroyed by the collective utopias, be it religion, nation state, or genocide, or all three at the same time. 
The ethical work of literature consists of providing space for striving to be human, of containing and including the notion of individual sovereignty. But that work is never to be completed. The struggle never stops. There are no conclusions. My professor and his thoughts can never be, alas, expunged from literature, for he and his failed humanity are implied in all the sovereign and failed individuals that populated the books he burned. Thank you. I can't promise answers, though. I think there is, I think, you know, um, I think literature, I mean, I, I, I worked on this this morning, then I changed, it's not that I changed my mind about it, but I acquired some new thoughts, because I, I can never finish anything, really. Um, but literature and art, for that matter, it's dialogue. It's a constant situation of dialogue. And in a, um, in a democratic, open society, that dialogue does not need to be foreclosed. There doesn't have to be a result to the dialogue. There doesn't have to be the conclusion. Um, in in um, closed modes of thinking, as it were, um, you know, in repressive regimes or nationalist regimes, the dialogue has to end with a with a certain set of conclusions, which are the, con the you know the um, assumptions that you started with, presumably. So what art does in Sarajevo, and I know a lot of people who are working in art, whether visual art, theater, film, or literature, is they are struggling to create a, a space for this continuous dialogue, and including critical dialogue, um, and very importantly, critical dialogue. Uh, and in this space, they um, imagine, and I imagine with them, they um, talk about the notions or concepts of identity and refuse to be reduced to uh, a nationalist, a national ethnic identity. Um, and so in that regard, literature and art has, has a great role. It reflects upon what happened in Sarajevo and Bosnia and the history of Bosnia and Yugoslavia and the world for that matter from a vantage point that is not defined by um, collective sovereignty, but rather individual sovereignty. This is very hard in Sarajevo, um, logistically, because to get the money for your project, you know, you uh, have a limited number of sources. It could be some sort of artistic international aid situation. To make a film, you have to ask a large number of European governments for money to make it, including the Bosnian government, which then, or the committee of the Bosnian government, which, you know, sometimes makes decisions based on political criteria. Um, but also, just to pro protect yourself, as it were, from, well, in a sense, being angry all the time or being under assault, uh, or being negative, as they say. 
So there are a lot of people who, who are doing that. It's very, very hard work, and for which I have great admiration. Um, and it's, uh, it is something that we can all learn from. To be a writer in the United States is a relatively privileged situation, but also fairly uninteresting. Because yeah. nobody cares about literature enough to try to ban it. There's a certain <laughs> aspect of um, flattering, and you know, if someone wants to ban your book, or even if it's a library committee, you know, it's, I would like some Arizona library to try to ban my book. I would put in my resume. But, um, you know, it doesn't really happen. And um, there are people, fight, they're kind of on the front line uh, of, of a kind of, uh, of struggle, to my mind. And I certainly relate to them personally and directly, but also theoretically, in the light of what I was just talking about. I was hoping you'd be willing to share whatever you would be willing about details of your journey here when you came, when you stayed, and uh, if you consider yourself a refugee, and then follow up on that um, when you first, I guess, wrote in English, like what that transition was like for you emotionally or intellectually or both. Well, it's a longer story. Um, I was here when the war started, and so I was not. I did not feel like a refugee, and technically I was not a refugee because the American government has to designate an area as the, an area of conflict, and then people from there, they get a refugee status, and then the processing of their applications for visas and such, and um, their help from relief agencies works differently. So because I was here when the war started, and I needed to resolve my um, status, um, the category of refugee was not available to me. I, in fact, applied for a political asylum. That was the only thing that was available for me. But even that was a little off, though I would have been in danger over there. Um, I would not have been the only one, really. Um, arguably, I insulted a large number of people working as a journalist back then. Um, and I knew my professor and people like that. Uh, but I was not a refugee. Um, I felt displaced and felt um, that I was part of the Bosnian experience, but I was on the fringes of it because I had not been exposed to war, had not been shot at, and was not in danger of being in a concentration camp at any point. So um, I didn't think I was a refugee. But in that situation of being displaced, I realized, and being here, um, without having decided really to stay here when I left Sarajevo. I had to decide what to do with my life and what to do with my writing, because I had been writing in Bosnia, not only journalistic work, but literature. And so for about three years, I could not write in either of, um, in either Bosnia nor English. Um, and I decided or realized that I would have to write in English because I would live here and, um, if literature is a mode of engagement for me with the world, then the world starts here, and here people speak English, and I would have to be able to write in English. So it took me a few years to enable myself to write in English. I did go back to writing in Bosnian, and I wrote a column for a magazine in Sarajevo in Bosnian, and have published as many words in Bosnian in the past 10 or 15 years as I have in English. Um, I don't know if this, these are details, really. Um, but I don't think we have time for all the details that I can provide. You can read it in the, in the Encyclopedia of the Dead after I die. <laughs> <laughs> all of it, the whole story. Yeah.